It's an interesting story how I got first turned on to um, the concept of uh, putting a speaker system into a empty room and um, sending signal into that room and then miking that room. That's the live chamber technique and that I don't know the total history of it in the recording world. It goes back, that was the first um, reverb units they had basically, that and plate reverbs back, you know, starting in the 50s when recording um, started getting more sophisticated. And they had to use whatever they could find to add ambience. And um, so live chambers were uh, one way to do that. Well, let's talk about miking a live chamber. That's kind of critical. It's um, there's a way to use a live chamber that is um, most effective, and and then there are ways that um, you know you weren't you're not going to get that same effect. Um, the weights room is not a big room, so to try to get the biggest sound out of it, um, I put the mics in diagonal corners. Um, I use large diaphragm condenser mics, and it does make a difference. Uh, you want to use good mics, obviously. Um, I like to use U87s. The trick is to put them up high in the corners, facing the wall. So you set them in a cardioid pickup pattern with the rejection side facing the room. So the live side of the mic, the hot side of the mic, is facing the wall. And this was a technique I learned in New York um, from an engineer named Tom Edmonds, um, who I met on a Meatloaf Live record. He wasn't using it as a live chamber, but he was recording drums in a very small room. And to get the best room ambience, he plays two 414s just right, you know, about four inches from the wall, facing the wall in the same manner I described. And it got a really big sound in a small room. So. That's that's how I get a um, the maximum uh, largeness of a room, or the maximum um, not only um, size but the left-right separation, the stereo separation. You get that um, much more if you have the two um, microphones pointing in, you know, miking opposite directions. Uh, and I later found out I um, when I started um, working on the Mule Variations record. I, um, the weights room was one of the primary locations, obviously, that he would be tracking in, and I had room mics up in the corners from the very get-go. So when he was doing even just piano and vocal and, and stand-up bass in that room, um, those there were also room mics going on in the manner I just described. Then I found out later that that was the exact way that um, an engineer named Chad Blake had mic'd that room, and Chad Blake was the one who had mixed Bone Machines, so my mic placement was confirmed, but, you know, Chad Blake is um, a top mix engineer. All right, so let me um, go into the background of live chambers and why they're so awesome and so much better than any other kind of uh, reverb. Um, for their particular application. Uh, my introduction to it on a personal level came at the beginning of a uh, Iggy Pop record called Instinct and I was the assistant engineer on the mix sessions and half the mix sessions for that were at a famous New York studio called the Power Station and the other half were at the studio I worked at which was called Platinum Island. And Bill Laswell, who was the producer, came in with the first mix from the Power Station to play um, for the mix engineer Bob Musso to give him an idea of um, you know how to make the album sound. Um, the mixes from the Power Station were going to be half of the record, mixed by Jason Corsero. Mixes at Platinum Island were going to be the other half of the record, mixed by Robert Musso. So he played this song, it's called Cold Metal, it's the first song on Instinct, and it's just a monster track, and it just sort of, you know, if you ever get a chance to hear it, it's, it's a very powerful track, and um, as soon as the playback was over, I could tell that it, it completely intimidated um, Musso, because it sounded so good. And um, I could tell that he created some anxiety in him, and um, after everyone left, he started, um, lamenting to me that, you know, how was he going to get it 
that powerful sounding and he mentioned that well you know power station has all these live chambers that sound great and um, you know how, how are we going to do that here and I said well we have a live chamber right there and I pointed to the to the live room and uh, we, let's just mic that up and see what happens and, and you know it was a good sounding room and it sounded great um, it sounded you know it was the best sounding drum reverb we had and um, and anyway the mixes that Bob did sounded you know different but as good as Jason's and they make a, a very powerful record so um, that became, you know, as soon as I heard how great it sounded and how much better it was than even the most expensive reverbs, even better than the Lexicon 224 or the 480, which were big reverbs, even better than the famous AMS um, DMX, you know, that was the sort of classic expensive reverb that you used on the drums back then. And, um, you know that beat them all and and then when I started working with Jason Corsero at Platinum Island who is my mentor and, and just one of the best mix engineers um, anywhere that was a top priority of his I didn't have to tell him that he knew to do that and that was kind of his main um, drum reverb uh, he would do all kinds of things to it like he would flange it and pitch shift it and stuff like that but it was based on the live room so flash forward to several years later, got a phone call from Tom Waits about recording with him and um, started researching his music and, and uh, was introduced to Prairie Sun. When I got to Prairie Sun the very first time, which was for an interview f with Tom Waits to talk about possibly working with him, I was met um, there by studio owner Muka Renick and he showed me around the rooms where we would be recording, which is um, what I now use as live chambers. 